Hello and welcome to this episode of The Box on Screen. My name is Chloe, I'm the Engagement Programmes Manager here at The Box and I'm joined today by... Hello, yeah, my name's Tony, I'm an Engagement Officer here at The Box. So The Box is Plymouth's brand new museum, gallery and archive. It's a fantastic space uh, where we look after over two million objects that tell the city and the wider region's heritage. It's well worth a visit, so if you haven't managed to get down to visit us yet, please do. There's lots to see and our collections cover all manner of topics from archaeology to natural history, maritime history to social history, from fine and decorative arts to contemporary work and much, much more. So there's lots to see uh, and do when you get chance to visit. But for those of you who aren't able to visit us just yet, we're going to be taking a look today at our fantastic moving image collection. So the box looks after approximately 250,000 film titles, which capture life in the region and from the city from approximately 1893 right through to present day. There's over 10,000 hours of footage within our collection and so for you today we've been diving deep into the archive uh, to share something that captures a really unique moment in Plymouth's history. Today we're here, we're going to talk about the Blitz, a period of Plymouth's history that um, was massively important to the city. Uh, it's a period during the Second World War where the city suffered massive destruction and devastation. Um, and to do that, we thought what would be useful to do is paint the picture of the city before the Blitz, before the Second World War, get an idea, let your viewers get an idea of what the city was like, you know, how dense it was, how many people lived here. Um, and we've got some wonderful clips of the city from the, the 1930s. So we're going to just show people those clips, let people have a look, at people having fun on the whole. Um, there's also celebrations for the Jubilee in 1935, so a few clips of that and then we'll talk a little bit more about how life changed massively for people once the Blitz happened. So amazing seeing some of that content on screen, isn't it? And it really feels very poignant when you know a lot of that content was captured in the 1930s. So perhaps little did Plymouthians know what was yet to befall the city and the, and the vast impact that that would have on people's everyday lives. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the footage showing people all coming together and enjoying themselves on the whole. The city started to know by about 1937 that things were, were bubbling up in Europe and that, you know, but 
there was something happening, war was on its way, potentially. However, Plymouth wasn't seen as a target city. Um, it was seen as too far away from Germany for any bombers to, to, to fly over. But it, you know, it started to take some preparation. All right. War broke out in 1939, as we know, um, but the Plymouth kind of carried on. It wasn't really much impact on the city until 1940. Um, France had fallen to Germany and suddenly Plymouth became a target. Um, on June the 30th, 1940, Plymouth had its first air raid siren and warning. So that was the first time people had heard that noise, that idea that there was, there was something potentially coming over that was, must have been really frightening to hear that noise. And then um, six days later on July the 6th, the first bombs fell on the city. So that was the start of uh, 59 separate air raids over the city. And sadly, even on that first bombing, three people lost their lives on bombs that fell on Swilly Road, um, now known as North Prospect Road, but at the time known as Swilly Road. This was a whole new chapter in Plymouth's history. This, a lot of things that happened in, in Plymouth's past are you know, things like Drake going off and sailing, etc. This was real history happening on the streets of the city. And you, you then had uh, this series of alert after alert after alert where the people of Plymouth had, are, are deciding what do we do? How do we, how do we live our lives? You know, we've got um, potentially we could go to bed at night and not wake up in the morning. So this is a terrifying time for people in the city. And the Blitz, as we know it, is actually, it's, it comes from the word Blitzkrieg, which is a, um, a a German word for lightning war and it's a, a, a form of warfare which is hit hard and fast and uh, the Blitz is kind of referred to a period of the bombing of the city that was a really heavy period of the bombing that started in March 1941 and people tend to think that's that's when we were bombed you know that's the only time we were bombed but the bombing raids that happened in March we'd had 32 separate bombing raids before we even got to March 1941. But we've got some really amazing footage from the day of March the 20th, 1941, which was when the, the, uh, that evening was the first real heavy bombing of the city. There have been a few other incidents of heavy bombing, but this is what we really regard as the Blitz. But what was really interesting about that day was that it was when uh, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth visited the city. Um, and they were in the city and there were thousands of people to greet them. And a few hours later, the city changed forever. Um, so if we want to perhaps run that footage and have a look and see them in the city, that'd be wonderful. Let's take a look. It's amazing footage, isn't it, when you see that in, in colour and also some amazing images there. And I think there's something very interesting about the story of who was collecting those images at that time and getting that footage from that time too. Absolutely, yeah, it, it is amazing footage and, and very rare footage to have, um, not just colour footage, but any footage during the war. 
because you weren't allowed to take a camera around with you. You weren't allowed to film, you weren't allowed to take photographs. Um, it was a matter of kind of national security. So the footage we just watched was by um, Stanley Leatherby, um, or Leatherby Cooper collection, which Stanley and his brother Francis were kind of bigwigs in the city. So they were Aldermans and the Lord Mayor. Um, so Stanley Leatherby was mayor before it became Lord Mayor in 1933-34, and Francis Leatherby was mayor in 1949. Um, so I think they had a bit of power, a bit of sway to be able to... Key people of the city. Key people. Um, uh, key people in business as well. They had a very successful drapers, etc. Uh, so they, they were able, they were clearly keen amateur filmmakers and uh, clearly had money to make it, to be able to produce colour film at that time. So we're incredibly lucky to have that within our collection. It's pretty much the only footage during the war of Plymouth that we have. Um, the still images there that we've just seen, the really powerful images, are by uh, a person called Fred Crisp. Now, Fred Crisp was a special constable during the war. He was also a sub-editor with the Western Morning News, um, which gave him permission to have a camera. So, again, we're really fortunate that he was able to take those shots. And it's unusual to see. We often see kind of aftermath, mm. but we don't see action shots as a such. And some of those shots of buildings on fire really bring home the kind of fear and the terror that must have been happening at the time. The city was ablaze, and the city was ablaze because there were hundreds of thousands of incendiary bombs dropped on it, as well as the high explosive bombs which caused the, the big damage and the craters. It, the hundreds of thousands of incendiaries lit the city up, so much so we have reports of people being able to see the city on fire from as far away as St Ives in Oakhampton in Torquay. And that, that's really hard to get your head around what that must have meant living here, being part of that. Mm, and responding to that at the time. Uh, absolutely, and not only responding. One of the interesting things about responding to it was that how we had like a kind of auxiliary fire service. Um, but one of the problems, this, it, was, it wasn't big enough. It was a small fire service, um, relatively so, for the kind of devastation we had. So we had fire services come from elsewhere in the country to try and help out. Unfortunately, their hoses wouldn't fit onto the fittings. So that led to the standardization of hose fittings after ex uh, periods in the Blitz where they just couldn't put the fires out because they couldn't get their hoses to work. Anyway, um, that life at that time you know, was not only scary for people living here, you imagine being a child in the city at the time. So if many of the children were evacuated, so they were, they were shipped out away from their families to other places across the southwest. But that in itself was, was an issue for Plymouthians because Plymouth wasn't a target, seen as being a target city. Lots of people from other places in the country had already taken the places in the southwest for, for evacuees. So lots of children had come down from London and Birmingham, etc. So there wasn't room for children from Plymouth. And a heartbreaking choice for any family to, to consider whether their child would be safer away from them than living in the city with them. Absolutely. I, I know we've got something really interesting at the box. We've got the bomb book, um, which people can see on display in our active archives. And that is an amazing record, isn't it? The bomb book of where bombs dropped on the city and to understand how the city has been shaped in some ways by those bombs being dropped. Uh, in incredible record and um, it's a really powerful document as you turn page after page and see the city just covered in, in, in red dots. Now those red dots represent high explosives. Not the, there were so many incendiary bombs that were dropped that you just couldn't record them all. The, the kind of heavy bombing in March and April there was an estimated at least 150,000 incendiary bombs dropped on the city. So the bomb book shows those heavy explosive bombs. It's a really poignant as you turn the page and you see just swathes of the city covered in red dots showing that these massive bombs dropped. And no doubt a completely terrifying time. But at the same point, there's this really interesting juxtaposition that actually life goes on. It certainly does, and, and we have, again, some really lovely footage from during that time uh, where you see people coming together and people trying to enjoy themselves and get on with life. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a bit like, 
you know, what else can you do? You have to kind of get on with it. Um, so whether you're trekking out at night to go and sleep under the stars to escape it during the day, uh, during the night, when you're coming together during the day, you're trying to make most of life. And maybe we can show some of that footage just to show how people came together. So obviously a, a really uh, interesting time in history and, and clearly people's day-to-day li day lives changed significantly. But after the war, there was a really interesting period in Plymouth's history when the reconstruction of the city and the, the return to what would become a, a new normal and a new civilian life really began. Oh, absolutely. And it, interestingly, it, wasn't, it kind of started during the war. So as all those bombs were, were being dropped on the city, um, like I said, the heaviest bomb in March and April. July that year, we had Lord Reith, the Minister for Works and Buildings, uh, visit Lord Waldorf Astor, who was the Lord Mayor of Plymouth at the time, and urged Astor to, to build um, with a bold plan and not to worry about finances and not to worry about going Showed on to... incredible foresight at the time, Unbelievable. This is 1941. We're mm. still being bombed. By September that year, Astor had invited the, uh, one of the country's leading architects and town planners, Professor Patrick Abercrombie, to come and work with the city um, to, to develop a plan to rebuild the city. And uh, Abercrombie came and worked with our city engineer, James Patton Watson, and between them they developed what's known as a plan for Plymouth, which was produced by 1943. Well, this is whilst we're still being bombed. The final bombing was, that happened in the city on the 30th of April 1944. By that point, the people of Plymouth had already been presented with a plan for rebuilding the city. And not just rebuilding the city centre, taking what was a very condensed and overpopulated kind of city pre-war and expanding it out and building all these amazing new uh, neighbourhoods with new housing and new industry, etc. And that's what we did. And um, that's, f for me, one of the things we really should be proud of in this city. We went from real adversity and kind of real terror. And within a few years, we had kind of picked ourselves up and started to rebuild and form the city that we know and love today. And one of the things I loved about this, and I only recently found out, was that the Plymouth Plan was actually shown in what was formerly the museum. Absolutely, yes. So the... Um, Town councillors used to meet in, um, in what's known as South Hall, or the actual gallery, now known as Our Art. Um, and they used to meet there, and that's where they took the decision to, to be able to fund the rebuilding. And also the museum was where the public got to see the plans for the rebuilding with a, a model and an exhibition um, presented to the city to show the city uh, exactly what, what the plan was. Uh, we've got some great footage, obviously, of rebuilding. Um, we're going to be able to see a little bit of that footage, 
some of the footage of Royal Parade. That was the kind of start of the rebuilding, which was 1947, and then some of the major buildings that were built in the city centre. So perhaps we could have a look at that. So amazing to see that footage of the reconstruction of the city and there's a lot of landmarks that we would recognise um, from our experiences of uh, going about daily life in the city centre today. But it's very poignant to think there are a huge number of civilian lives that were lost you know, almost 80 years ago uh, this year as a result of that blitz bombing. Almost 1,200 civilian lives were lost and let alone the landscape completely changed for people in Plymouth. You know, houses, businesses, it all changed, didn't it? Absolutely, yeah. You, yeah. As well as the, the kind of loss of life, there were 5,000 properties completely destroyed, including 49 churches, 18 schools, completely destroyed for that period. Uh, there were 70,000 other properties that were damaged, you know, around 5,000 people who suffered injury. You know, so it's really hard to get your head around those figures. But I think what's What's really interesting about seeing this footage is, is seeing how people kind of just got on with it. And you know, with all that, that devastation around them, they, they took that and they, they bounced back. The city bounced back. Pre-war, there were 220,000 people who lived in Plymouth. By the end of the war, that dropped to around about 120,000. So the city had to work hard to attract people back to it and bring people back who had for right, you know, many reasons it left. The city did that so well by grabbing hold of that plan in, during the war, 
taking the decision to really run with it and really kind of be one of the first cities to start rebuilding and pretty much the first city to complete its rebuilding programme and the city to, to do the most comprehensive rebuilding programme in the country. And that's what brought people back, whether it's to the housing estates such as Southway and Ernie Settle with the new housing and new industry, or the shiny Portland stone clad buildings in the city centre. You know, this footage is wonderful to see because it's wonderful to see the, the, what is probably the most important point of Plymouth's history because it's the point that affected the most Plymouthians. Thanks Tony. I mean it's an amazing uh, period in our city's history. It's probably all we've got time for today. But if you've enjoyed watching at home, please do take a moment to subscribe to our channel for more episodes of The Box on Screen coming soon. And head to our website www.theboxplymouth.com and there's all sorts of information about how you can visit us and also about considering becoming a member too for lots of great benefits. And if you've really enjoyed delving into the archives today, you can also head to the BFI player, which has got lots of content um, online, so you can enjoy delving into our archives for yourself. Thanks very much, and we look forward to seeing you soon.